start linking, then yeah. we are recording. Great. Are you? So. Then we start this second lecture, and everybody can hear me. Yes. Good. Then we move to the next picture. You remember from the last lecture that we use the US textbook. And I will focus very much on the difference between the US economic system and the Norwegian. And I will, to a great extent, add Norwegian case studies, as I promised you last time. And also, this is a course where you will be trained to use models. Simple models. Theoretical based models. It's a kind of training in <coughs> logistics because logistics is all about small and very often mathematical models that you need to apply on real world cases. And this course is to learn basics to learn game theory and that is not that difficult. What is very difficult is to apply this theory to apply these models on real world cases because to understand the economy and study in logistics to understand our economy in that perspective you need to understand the real world around you so I will try to train you to use models applied on real world cases that will help you to analyze real world using small models and applying them. And last time I said that we have three different um, chapters. We start with basics modern industrial organization and business practices. And we move now a little bit faster with picture two. From the textbook, the author discuss perfect competition. And all of you have had the course in microeconomics. And perfect competition is not that difficult to understand. But the textbook will tell us that a perfect competitive system you never see in real life. Because real life isn't that easy. What you see always is a kind of competition within industrial sectors. But it's very, very difficult to understand how these complex markets work. And perfect competition is only where we start to understand in depth how a market system works when we assume <coughs> perfect competition. And in the textbook, there is a very clear tendency that they believe that perfect competition and moving the, co the economy 
towards that direction will give the best solution in a welfare perspective. And there is a kind of warning in the textbook that regulations can very often be costly. I think that the Norwegian approach to industrial organization is quite opposite. It is to have a market system, to understand perfect competition, and to go through all the assumptions and see why they not work in real life and see why they don't always help us to maximize welfare. And the Norwegian system is to focus to a great extent how to help the market system to approach the ideal world with maximum welfare. So our economy is regulated. We try to understand complex markets to help the market, while the textbook, when you read it, has a tendency to believe that the market is very often efficient enough. Huh. Efficient enough. But the learning process after the financial crisis is that to believe too much in efficient markets can be very costly. And when we come to the opposite market system compared to perfect competition, that's a monopoly. That doesn't exist in real world either. Because when you have a monopoly, the power will be in the hands of only one producer that will maximize profit, put the prices as high as possible to maximize profit. So to say, in these two market forms, there will be no strategic interactions between players. In perfect competition, there are many producers, many consumers, but they act as price takers. So prices are given from somewhere and they all act as if the prices were fixed. None of the players will play as a player. They will take the prices as given. So there will be no such thing as power because competition will make sure that only those players will survive that will be the most cost efficient players. So these two, perfect competition and monopoly, is where we start. And we are going to deal more with complex markets, Kono again, Bato again, monopolistic competition. And these models when the models where we use game theory. In the textbook, you have this figure one one. I just skip that, just read it. That's not that important when I teach. And in the textbook, they focus the Ch Ch Chicago School as one of the main uh, schools where this industrial organization started in its new approach. Here in Norway, in 
industrial organization is more close to the French school. La Fontirol had a textbook from 1988. That's a very difficult one. But the Norwegian approach is more towards the La Fontirol approach. While that is a textbook so technical that it's no textbook for you in this course. Therefore, the U.S. textbook is a good textbook to understand industrial organization. And when I teach that textbook, to have the Norwegian approach, it might even be that that textbook makes it easier for you to understand industrial organization. And the last ballot point here, the antitrust laws, when you read the textbook, there are so many pages dealing with the antitrust law, because that law is that important in US, it's also important in Norway. But I can just remind you from the very beginning that when I teach, everything in the textbook that deals explicitly with US antitrust laws, I'm skip. You are allowed to read it. <laughs> And some of you might learn something. And I will just focus some main points that is of great importance to you when you will be operators out there and when you take part in a competitive tendering uh, competition. As for example, if you take part as a player bidding for a contract and if you will be three players and you know each other and you start talking together and if one of you make notes that the antitrust body will find and they will say that this can prove that you have agreed on prices, that you have fixed the prices together, you will, put, you will be put directly into jail. So that's the reminder <laughs> that the antitrust law is serious and it's important, but this is a part of the regulation system and I will focus more of the important regulation system and how it works in the Norwegian system. Next feature, and that one is for you to read in the textbook. Next one. Basics chapter two. This is when firms meet and play, you will see that you have actions of firms in oligopolistic industries. And in the textbook they keep on reminding us of how complex this system is when we assume profit maximization. Can we assume profit maximization? Is that an assumption we can believe in in real life? And what is the understanding of transaction costs. 
How many of you are familiar with the concept transaction costs? Some of you. And that is a rather complex one. And that comes from um, two economists that came up with the concept, and Williamson was the second one. And transaction costs is the important logistical topic. Either you produce the inputs internally, and you have internal transactions to produce all the inputs as inputs within the company, or you use the market. If you decide to use the market, you end up in what we call transaction costs. And the topic and the example in the textbook is Dell, make or buy. A company as Dell can produce a computer either using the market and buy all the inputs from the market if Dell will find that to be most cost efficient, they will use the market. And they will use the internal production to the extent that if the internal transaction will be just equal to the transaction cost when you use the market, and if you are break even, you choose to use it internally. And if the market will give you lower costs, then that's the reason for the company to buy. And remember from the textbook in microeconomics. You remember that we only lectured over production costs. Now it is more important to understand that when we in this course use cost, it is both production costs and transaction costs. And when Dell, to a great extent, will just assembly, everything will, produced, will be produced by the market. It's just a company for assembly. This is an example where they outsource and use the market to a great extent, make buy, instead of make themselves, they buy. And my case will often be the shipyards in Norway that compete for contracts with the oil companies. 25 years ago, to a great extent, <coughs> they had much more inputs produced internally. Now, they have more or less learned from Dell, and to a great extent, they buy from the market because of the advantage to use the marketplace. And let's see now 
what the advantage will be. Why could the market be more efficient than make themselves? And in the textbook, there are three main advantage that you have to understand. Either it is economies of scale, meaning that if it is less expensive to produce the inputs in an outside company, and if that will give economies of scale, meaning that a company can produce an input and deliver to many other companies, and economies of scale will give that company an advantage with lower average costs. Economies of scale is always that the average costs will decrease. And if you have economies of scope, and economies of scope is if you produce two different products more cost efficient than producing each one in each company, you take advantage of putting these two inputs together and the advantage economies of scope is to produce more cost efficient. And the third factor is risk. How come? The market advantage is if one firm will deliver to many other customers, then they can pool over different demand, different customers, and they can reduce the risk, which is an important driving force for extra cost. And last, but not least, if the production of an input is outsourced to the marketplace, you will easily have many players out there that will compete against each other. And through competition, you will have a cost-efficient production, while if you produce internally, you might easily end up with less pressure to reduce costs because of not too much competition. So the maybe most important advantage of the marketplace is the forces towards efficiency from competition. And the more the companies compete, the harder the competition, the less of extra cost to pay for the company. So they take advantage of using the market because of economies of scale, economies of scope, scope risk, and competition. What are the problems? No? <laughs> you have to be patient. What are the problems? The main problem is information. 
and when we deal with game theory later on we will see that information is a very critical factor why come? if you are going to sign a contract is that easy in the marketplace? No. first you have to specify exactly what you are going to buy that's not always very easy because quality will have to be specified in the specification of what you are going to buy we just call it the spec the spec and once you have been able to specify that exactly and you believe that it's correct enough the problem is you have to look for all the suppliers that are serious enough to come on the business list and if you invite unserious companies on business list you run the risk that there is a winner that can really give you great problems in the future so all the companies that you put on business list you have to go through properly to understand why this is a serious company and that takes time costs money this is a part of the transaction costs where you need to come up and invest in information and once you have the bidders list you start to look for the winner and that's not always easy either because if they compete over price and quality how to quantify quality that isn't easy so you just have to believe that the indicators you come up with capture the main part of the quality that is so important for your product to be successful in the market and once you have decided which one will win the contract you have to negotiate you have to sign the contract and then you have the follow up that's costly and you end up using a lot of internal sources as transaction costs to contract in the marketplace often you forget all these internal costs the transaction costs that you have to add to the production costs this is also what we in the text called bounded rationality and because of that because you cannot predict all contingencies within a contract you can never predict exactly what will happen in the future a chance to understand all the possible contingencies that might appear in the future you end up to write an incomplete contract what's meant with an incomplete contract not every contingency will be there in the contract you have signed and when suddenly something will come up 
that you don't find in the contract. Suddenly, you'll meet your, uh, your supplier in the court. Is that the transaction cost? Definitely. Definitely. So, incomplete contracts is what you have to live with. And the most complicated topic here is quality. And one of my master thesis last year made his thesis within this subject for the maritime industry. How to deal with contracts when quality is important? And why is this a big problem in the marketplace? It's not a big problem if you can always assume that all the players out there are friends. That's not what it is in real life. If you develop trust, and in this field, trust is very important. If you develop trust, if you trust each other, if you contract, and you have an incomplete contract, and if you have relations that you have developed over time, step by step, and you make a contract with a supplier that you really trust, that's much easier. But immediately, when you come up with a conflict, where one of the players have economic incentives to do exactly what you don't want them to do, then it is for him either to behave economic, economic ration or to think on you in the long run as your friend and just focus trust. In real life opportunistic behavior is important. And this is a topic that I want you very much to reflect over now in the beginning, because these topics makes all the models we deal with later on more complex than very often we really like. <laughs> because of lack of information, incomplete contracts, opportunistic behavior, trust, the transaction costs can end up to be rather high, giving some companies incentives to produce internally. <coughs> and once you have had the experience as within the maritime industry, where we had a boom, five, six years ago, we had a boom. And that boom ended up with many suppliers not delivering in time. And when the suppliers had to choose which one of the shipyards we deliver to in time, and which one will have the delay. then the one that will have the experience with not delivering in time, they will have great fines from the oil companies that will be very costly and the experience in this region 
was that these extra costs was not covered by the suppliers. Therefore, now in this sector there is a trend that part of the inputs that earlier was outsourced from production in the market, some of the key inputs are now produced internally. So it is uh, one period outsourcing, one period to start internally, and then again outsourcing. So this is a kind of game that will go on in the future and there will be trends where outsourcing is the very strong underlying trend but after a period with the experience of high transaction costs, you will for a while see the opposite, as we have seen in the mine time industry for a period now. When are transaction costs high? It's easy to conclude that if you have an input, for instance, if you need to have service from a machine, and if you need that once, you can contract the market, and you can use the market, and sign a contract, because it's only once, but if it is a frequent service, you need it very often, you have to contract so frequently that the transaction costs might be very high. So one conclusion is that if you as a buyer, and many of you will be buyers, if you have an input that you will buy frequently, contract frequently, the transaction costs will be high. In addition to that, the transaction costs will be high due to uncertainties. Due to uncertainties and asset specificity. What is meant with asset specificity? <coughs> that is if you have an asset that is specific to produce exactly that car that Toyota is going to produce this year. If that will be a delivery from a company, then you have a problem because the power will be in the hands of the supplier and you as a buyer will have to sign a contract that will be much too expensive because in real life the supplier will use that, that power with the asset specificity to increase the price of the input. So, in my hand, this chapter on transaction cost theory is quite brief in the textbook. But it's very complicated to really understand it. It's not a technical part of the textbook. You need just to read it once, 
read it over again, think it through, read it once more, think it through, and then finally in the end, when we meet in the exam, it might be that you will say, aha, now I think I understand what he meant with transaction costs. If some of you already have that experience, <laughs> come and tell me. Because every time when I read it this morning, think it through, in my head, every time I feel, wow, again, this is the most complicated text I will teach in this course. <laughs> Even though the models we are going to deal with will look technically quite complex later on, this is maybe one part that I hope you start to fight with to try to understand, and finally, when I conclude now, we agree that all the players out there, they try to minimize costs, and that's always production costs, as you are familiar with, and the important topic from the logistical theory to reduce both production costs and transaction costs. So now we have a contract. Then we take a break. <laughs>